All right. Welcome, everybody, to our third lecture series. I am so, so, so excited and honored, as always. My name is Lori Clark. Um, I am, I'm very honored to be the host of the calls. And uh, our guest lecture, this is our third series, is uh, I think this one is um, probably the most exciting one for me. And uh, Dr. Marco Ruggiero, I'll give you a little bit of background for those of you who uh, are meeting him this evening for the first time. Um, he was born in Firenze, Italy in 1956. He graduated from the School of Medicine at the University of Firenze in 1980. So we do have a, uh, a licensed doctor. He served in the Army as Lieutenant Medical Officer. And in 1984 to 1986, he worked at the Laboratory of Cellular and Molecular Biology of Burroughs. Now, he published a paper there sponsored by Nobel Prize laureate Sir John Vane. He also subsequently worked at the National Cancer Institute um, of the National Institutes of Health of the U.S. in Bethesda, Maryland. And that's where he performed research on oncogenes and signal transduction. And if you're interested in that, go back to the first call, uh, which we have posted up on YouTube, and I'll, I'll refer at the end of the call to this in the chat, uh, because that extensive body of research is what is focused on in the first lecture series that he did. Um, he returned to Italy as professor of molecular biology at the University of Friends until his retirement in 2014. So in his 36 years of scientific career, this very accomplished doctor, medical researcher, and scientist has published more than 150 peer-reviewed articles. He has been invited to participate in hundreds of congresses and conferences, and one in particular we're gonna be highlighting this evening, the Autism One Conference, because that's a big, big, significant piece of what we're talking about this evening. Uh, his main research interests are in the fields of oncology, neurosciences, and immunotherapy. And so one of the main things that's happening in the world today is the realization that our food supply does not give us the nutrients that our body needs to function. And many of us think that the only brain we have is the one above our neck. And believe it or not, there are some others. And Dr. Ruggiero is going to be focusing on the third brain, which is the one that he uh, has coined the term the third brain. And uh, we are blessed as well to have the co-author of the book, The Third Brain, uh, Peter Greenlaw, online as well. And uh, without further ado, what I'd like to do is pass it over to him because he's the one who's worked with Dr. Ruggiero, and uh, they're the ones who've published this incredible uh, piece of work. So, uh, Peter, I have unmuted you, so if I can pass it over to you at this point, I would be thrilled. Wow, well, thank you very, very much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, Dr. Ruggiero, do you actually have the cover slide for the book? Oh, there we go. Okay. So actually, Lori, it's called Your Third Brain. And um, this was uh, one of those incredible coincidences, at least I don't believe in coincidences anymore because so many have happened to me. But uh, <clears throat> I was privileged to be a speaker at Autism One in 2014 in Chicago. Dr. Ruggiero was one of the keynote speakers, but I was at least there. And we met and decided that um, uh, the research that I'd been doing, because I'd published two previous books, was of great interest to him. And then we decided to collaborate on this book, Your Third Brain. Now, I must say, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I tell people all the time, I said, honestly, when Dr. Ruggiero first started to talk to me about this, it was literally like science fiction. So my first huge epiphany was this. He says, Peter, imagine, in his wonderful Italian accent, he said, imagine an organ that's gone undetected for 3,000 years in medicine and human anatomy, an organ that weighs twice as much as our liver. I said, what are you talking about? Because I didn't even know we had a second brain. So I'm sure he'll talk about that in a minute or two, but he, he sort of transitioned between. And just that concept was so unbelievable. And of course, in the book, and I know you've read it, Lori, that we talk about in the one chapter about the eureka moment when Dr. Ruggiero literally realized that this organ was much more than just a um, sort of conglomeration of bacteria and viruses, fungi, yeast, and, and bacteria. But in essence, it was a brain because it did have neurons and it performed the functions that no one even knew that it had had. had, had, had existed, let alone that it was responsible for so many, as, as Dr. Ruggiero taught me, really the development and the function of every other organ in our body. And I, I mean, I was completely blown away. 
I mean, most of the time when he talked to me, I'd have to say, I'm sorry, but can you like translate that? Not just into English, but into so that I could understand it. And, you know, I, I admit that I'm not the expert. I'm an expert on the experts. And, you know, I, I just really want to thank him for his patience to deal with, you know, sort of a, a lay person and really explain this. I'm very proud of our book because we did write it, although there's tremendous scientific backup to it. We also laid it out in a way that um, normal people like myself could actually understand it. But I honestly believe that this book is is one of the most revolutionary books that's out there. And I'm not saying that because I'm, you know, self-serving. It's it's really the people that have been able to uh, get get their hands on it have all commented that, oh, my gosh, this is really a game changer. And one of the most significant discoveries maybe in the history of, of medicine, uh, I don't know what would be bigger than this. So. I'm so privileged to, you know, have Dr. Ruggiero as a, as a colleague and, and a friend. And, uh, you know, what he's taught me, I couldn't have gone to, well, even if I'd gone to school for 30 years with him, I wouldn't be anywhere near as smart as him. But I, I'm just humbled and honored that, you know, this book has really contributed already to, to many, many people's lives. So that's kind of what I wanted to say about it. And uh, he's the one that can really explain it much in much greater detail than myself. That is absolutely, um, thank you so much for sharing that and, and for sharing the story because you worked together and that was the excitement that I had, just what you've identified, that eureka moment and just the magic of what this is. I mean, 3,000 years undetected. <laughs> Are you guys ready? Are you curious now? <laughs> I think at this point, we're going to pass it over uh, to Dr. Ruggiero to uh, enlighten us all. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Lori. And I don't know whether I am unmuted, so I don't know what. Okay, so you can uh, hear me. That's good. And thank you so much, Peter, for this wonderful introduction and uh, for all your support. I wouldn't be here, the book wouldn't exist if it weren't for you. So I all, will always acknowledge this. Now, as you know, uh, before we start, we have to. Uh, read these formalities uh, that uh, tonight we will not be talking about any cure for any disease and we are not giving uh, any medical prescription or advice uh, and none of the statements uh, has to be interpreted uh, for a cure for any possible disease. Now that we know this, uh, let's start and let's uh, try to find out how many brains uh, have we. Because uh, until uh, I would say a few years ago, we thought that we only had one brain and the brain inside our heads. And we know this brain for centuries and centuries. This is an Italian researcher or scientist of 1543 who first began describing the anatomy of the entire body and of course the anatomy of the brain. So the brain inside our heads has been studied for centuries and we know many, many things about this brain that today we define as the first brain. And it was about 100 years ago when several researchers, and in particular this Broadman, they began to study each single minute area of the brain and to trace the relationship between each area and functions. So these are called the Broadman areas of the brain and they are numbered with regular numbers. And let's take a very quick look, for example, at the functions that these areas of the brain control. So this is our prefrontal cortex, exactly it is here. And so let's take a look. This area of the brain that is called the prefrontal cortex is a thought to control a number of very important functions. It contains these areas that are numbered 9, 10, 11, 12, 46 and so on. And many authors have indicated a link between the personality of a person and the functions of these areas of the brain. And this area has been implicated in planning a complex cognitive behaviors expression of personality, making of decisions, and moderating also the social behavior. 
and the basic activity of this region of the brain is considered to be the orchestration of thoughts and actions in accordance with internal goals. So we're talking about very sophisticated functions. And now if we go in detail and we take, for example, just a, a couple of examples, the area of Broadman that is labeled number nine, that is exactly in this part of our brain. Here there is our nose. So this part of the brain is the Broadman area number nine, and we just check the functions that are under the control of this area, we see that it is involved in the short-term memory, in evaluating recent events, in overriding automatic responses, so that essentially we don't behave only instinctively in the verbal fluency that in my case is much better in Italian than in English, but I do my best to have some fluency also in English. In the detection of errors, I've not found any errors in this writing of mine as yet. In the verbal auditory attention, the attention that those of you who are on the iPhone will have today. In the in inferring the intentions of the others, uh, this is rather difficult because inferring what you are thinking or what your intentions are, it's a very difficult task. And inferring deduction from spatial imagery and inductive reasoning, attributing intention, sustained attention involved in counting a series of auditory stimuli. To make it short, this area seems to control some of the most complex and sophisticated functions of our brain. Let's move only to another area, area number 46, the number of the famous Valentino Rossi Italian motorcycle rider. I don't know why he likes this number because this was the race number he had at the beginning of his career. So the area number 46 in the prefrontal area of our brain controls again a number of very sophisticated functions, uh, sustaining attention and working memory. Lesions in this area impair the short-term memory and cause difficulty in inhibiting the responses. That is, we are no longer able to behave in an educated and manly matter, manner. We behave instinctively. And lesions may also eliminate much of the ability to make judgments about the relevance of a stimulus, as well as causing problems in organization. And the Area 46 has recently been found to be involved in exhibiting self-control, the one that we should always have, in particular when we are in a traffic jam. And this uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is one of the few areas that deactivated during uh, the rapid eye movement sleep. So in short, again, also this area. And we could go on for hours and hours describing all the extremely complicated functions that are under the control of each single minute area of the brain. So we think that we have mapped all the areas of the brain. This gentleman here is Constantin von Economo, an Italian who lived in Trieste about 100 years ago, who helped mapping the brain. So you see, each minute area of the brain controls some function and these areas in the prefrontal cortex are some of the most complicated functions. Okay, let's move from Trieste, Italy. Well, in those days it was Austro-Hungarian Empire. And let's go to southern France, and in particular to Marseille, a port city in southern France, made famous by a number of movies. This is an old movie with Jean-Paul Belmondo and Claudio Cardinale in the 60s, I guess, and many other movies later on. And why do we go to Marseille? Because in Marseille there is a hospital and a university, of course, the Université de la Méditerranée, of the Mediterranean Sea, and it's not maybe as prestigious as Yale or Oxford, but still it's a very good university. And it was in 2007 when three neurologists, they wrote, coming from this Université de la Méditerranée in Marseille, France, they wrote a paper that you can retrieve in PubMed in probably the most prestigious medical journal that is Lancet or The Lancet. Actually, there are two most prestigious medical journals. One is the New England Journal of Medicine and the other is the Lancet. So what is uh, this paper all about? Uh, the title sounds funny, Brain of a White Collar Worker. 
So let's see what do they write. It's uh, only a few words long. It's not a long paper, it's half a page. But it's half a page that may change forever the history of human perception of the brain or of the brains. So, as you see, they come from the Department of Neurology, de la Faculté de Médecine de l'Université de la Méditerranée, and they write in rather plain English, probably. Uh, they speak English as good as I do, so they had to translate. And so they saw a 44-year-old man who presented with a two-week history of mild left leg weakness, so an extremely trivial condition. Now, when this guy was uh, six months of age, he had had a hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus means accumulation of fluid inside your skull, simply because the fluid uh, could, cannot drain properly. Not a big problem if you can diagnose this early, as they did, and they put a shunt that is like a little tube so that the fluid could drain. Then, when he was 14 years old, he had developed some neurological symptoms uh, because essentially this uh, tube, this uh, shunt had clogged. And so they simply revised, replaced most probably the shunt and everything went well. At the age of 44, his neurological development and medical history were absolutely normal. He was married, he was father of two children, and he worked as a civil servant. Maybe it could be ironic to think that he worked in the tax office of the government of France. So hopefully he helped with tax declarations. This is to say that he was an intelligent person by all means, and he drove in the chaotic traffic of Marseille, so he was absolutely perfectly normal and his uh, intelligence quotient was normal, and everything was absolutely normal. Now, since he had uh, this uh, mild weakness in his left leg, he underwent uh, some routine analysis. But when they did a CAT scan first and an MRI scan later of his head, just to rule out any problem, any ictus or any brain tumor, these things that may be responsible for a leg weakness, what they found was absolutely incredible. Essentially, the CAT scan and the MRI showed that the man had almost no brain inside his head. Of course, you don't believe me, so look at the images and evaluate for yourself. Even though you're not a radiologist, you can recognize the skull and all the black is liquid. The gray area is the brain. So this is another image. And you see that in this hemisphere, there is absolutely no brain, only the white bone. And the brain is this very, very thin slice of tissue. Look at here. In this area, no brain, and here the brain is a very thin layer of tissue. Where have all those areas of Broadman, of Broca, or those described by Konstantin von Economogon? They aren't here. There is nothing. So compare these images with the images that I've shown you before, and you see a clear discrepancy. This guy has I would say 5% of the brain tissue that we are supposed to have to function normally. And nevertheless, this guy functioned perfectly normally. And after they changed the shunt, all his neurological examination, which means the weakness, became normal within a few weeks. And nevertheless, the CT, the CT scan, did not change. So the guy was normal, remained normal, and nevertheless, there was almost no brain inside his head. At this point, you can take all the atlases of human anatomy, of neuroanatomy in particular, and use them to light your fire, because evidently, all that we have known thus far about the human brain and about the functions of the human brain at least is limited, at least if not it is completely false. Why? Because here you have a guy with no brain, 
functioning perfectly well, driving in the chaotic traffic of Marseille, working as a civil servant with no brain. Now, we have seen something similar in a completely different case, in a clinical case that has been reported in a global medical discovery about one year ago, slightly more than one year ago. In this case, the guy was a former boxer. And this guy, because of the traumas that he had had, was missing a great part of this hemisphere. And the other hemisphere was occupied by a big brain tumor. It is called a glioblastoma. Uh, I will make the story short because it is a story more of oncology than of neurology. So we helped this guy with our immunotherapeutic approach up to the point when the guy was eligible for operation. He went to this uh, state-of-the-art uh, neurosurgery hospital in Hanhofer, Germany, where they operated, and look what they did. They removed a great part of his brain. This uh, CT scan was taken and during the operation, so you see all these uh, things uh, of the operation. So on this part, he already was missing a brain because of his... Uh, youth in the boxing and this other part of the brain was completely removed to remove the tumor and guess what the guy was in excellent shape and he survived several months and eventually he died not because of the tumor he died because of a trivial urinary tract infection something that may happen at old age but in those several months that he survived the operation he had absolutely no neurological sign. Now, you may wonder, what happens then to our intelligence? Uh, this is uh, Alfred Benet, another French researcher, one of the first to develop some intelligence tests, some tests to evaluate people's intelligence. So, uh, we have already seen that all those areas described by Brodman and Broca and all those correlations between each particular area of the brain and a function may be overridden or may be not completely responsible. But what happens to the general concept of intelligence? Well, here we have another study that has gone almost unnoticed and that was published in 1992. And also the title is not so inviting. What does it mean? Reciprocal neurological developments in twins discordant for hydrocephalus. Let me try to translate from a broken English into plain English. Still broken, but let me try to translate. So here, these authors, they studied a set of twins. And these twins, four were dizygotic and six were identical or monozygotic. Now, these twins were twins, but they differed for one feature. One of the twins, but not the other, had developed hydrocephalus in his uh, infancy. Again, this is the picture taken from Wikipedia. You see hydrocephalus means accumulation of fluid inside the skull with concomitant reduction of brain tissue. Obviously, because the skull is a closed cavity, so if uh, fluid accumulates, the neurons are compressed, they die, and in the end, you have many less neurons and glial cells. So essentially, here we have twins that are genetically identical, like this monozygotic. They live in the same families, they're fed the same food, and so, so they're identical for all their features but one. One of the two twins has much less brain tissue because of the hydrocephalus. Identical twins, only difference, much less brain tissue. Guess what? Those with less brain developed above average intelligence. Follow-up studies also documented development of above average intelligence despite drastically reduced cerebral mental size in hydrocephalus of early onset. So again, it seems that uh, less brain we have, more intelligent we are. So this is open to a number of jokes that we may <laughs> infer from these findings. And again, this paper, just like the one in Lancet, has not received much attention from the medical scientific community for a very simple reason. 
it put at risk all our knowledge about the neurology, about the functioning of the brain. But we have been talking enough about the first brain and maybe how can we do without the first brain. So let's see if there are other brains and I anticipate there are several other brains. So let's move and let's go to the second brain. This is an ultrasound image of the brain inside our heads that I took in a paper published in Medical Hypothesis in 2012, where the first author is my lovely wife, Dr. Stefania Pacini. And why do I mention her? Well, first of all, it's always a good thing to mention uh, your colleague and wife, but also because she published the paper without me as a co-author, and this might mean something. In 2004, that is one of the first description of the neurons in the second brain. So what is then this second brain? This second brain is nothing else but all the neurons that are embedded, the neurons are the cells of the nervous system, neurons that are embedded in the layers of the GI tract from the mouth down to the anus. So let's give some uh, description, some definition. These uh, system of neurons is called the enteric nervous system and it has been described as a second brain for several reasons. It can operate autonomously. In other words, it takes its own decisions even without the intervention of the brain inside our heads. It normally communicates with the central nervous system inside our heads through the parasympathetic, that is the vagus nerve, and the sympathetic, that is the prevertebral ganglia nervous system. However, when the vagus nerve is a severe this cut, the enteric nervous system continues to function. So we have a second brain that is not so irrelevant because it is made by some 500 million cells, neurons, that is a fraction of the neurons that we have inside our heads, but still it is five times as many as the 100 million neurons that we have in the spinal cord. So we have, a, let's say, a small but rather distributed second brain that is embedded in the thickness of the walls of our GI tract from the mouth down to the anus. Now, until now, we have been talking of the first and the second brain. So let's move to the third brain that is uh, the main topic of the book uh, that Peter and Laurie have mentioned. But before we move to the third brain, we have to give another definition of who we are, how human we are. Well, now this uh, has entered the uh, the popular knowledge because there are books on Amazon that are entitled 10% Human. And I would say that somebody should write a book entitled 1% Human. What do I mean? Well, in the past four or five years, it has been discovered that the number of microbial cells, and when I say microbial, I mean bacteria, yeast, fungi, parasites, protozoan, viruses, microbes in general terms. The number of microbial cells in our body is 10 times the number of human cells. So uh, if we go to this nice uh, tutorial of the University of Utah that uh, you can download for free, it is called the Learn Genetics, and you'll uh, go at this section, the human microbiome, you can read. Microbes are everywhere, in the soil, in the water, and even in our bodies. That's right, microbes uh, cover every surface of our bodies, both inside and out. These microscopic life forms represent thousands of species and they outnumber our own cells by about 10 to 1. So if we look at ourselves and we count our human cells, we end up with a figure. Then please consider that in our body, in this very moment, there are 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. That's why somebody has written a book, only 10% human. But things go even worse when you look at the genes. You know, genes are those instructions, the blueprint for all the functions of life that are embedded in DNA. Well, all these microbes also have DNA and all these microbes also have genes. Point is that they are not human genes. 
how many genes uh, do the human have? About 22,000. So essentially in our DNA, there are about 22,000 pieces of information that are called genes. And how many genes are there in the human microbiome? With the term microbiome, we indicate this array of microbes that live with us. Well, nobody knows for certain, the figures go from two millions to eight millions. So even if we stay low with two millions, we have a hundred times more microbial or non-human genes in this very moment giving their instructions to our body than human genes. That's why from the genetic point of view, we are at best 1% human, maybe less than 1% human. And since life is encoded in DNA, we could say that our human life is encoded in human DNA, maybe for less than 1%. And of course, all these microbes aren't there for nothing. They co-evolved with us during the course of evolution. Probably they preceded us. For sure, they did precede us. And of course, they are involved in health and disease. Again, you go to the tutorial of the University of Utah and you uh, take a look at the list of all the diseases that are somehow associated with alteration of the equilibrium of the balance of the microbes in our body. Essentially, all diseases you can think about, from cancer to autism to psychiatric diseases, diabetes, uh, obesity, malnutrition, I would say everything. But today, we want to focus about uh, the brain and the function of the brain. So let's click on depression and anxiety and let's see what the University of Utah tells us. It tells us what we know. The vagus nerve runs between the gut and the brain, carrying information in both directions. So this means connecting the first brain inside our heads and the second brain that are the human neurons embedded in the walls of our intestine. Stimulation of the vagus nerve is sometimes used to treat depression. And then they come with a rhetoric question. Could future treatments for anxiety and depression involve manipulating gut microbes? Well, that, that's a very interesting uh, question. They say, what if we manipulate the composition of the microbes in our intestine? Could this help in fighting uh, psychiatric disorders? Well, let's see, because now the question becomes, who is manipulating whom? In other words, it's us humans who want to manipulate the microbes for our own purposes, our own fitness, or by any chance, are the microbes who are manipulating us? Who is to decide? Who, is, who has the free will? So now you see we are moving into uh, philosophical concepts, but let's go to PubMed, let's stay anchored to scientific reality, and let's read these words that were published in 2014. So again, I am honored to present very recent research. And the title is already intriguing. It says, is eating behavior it means what we like. I like pizza. Oh, no, I like hamburgers. Oh, I like wine. No, I like beer. Is heat eating behavior manipulated by the gastrointestinal microbiota? Question mark. Let's read. And these are statements. Microbes in the gastrointestinal tract are under selective pressure to manipulate host eating behavior. Host is us. To increase their fitness. So try to understand, they manipulate our eating behavior, and the eating behavior is the most fundamental of all behaviors, not to increase our human fitness, to increase their fitness, sometimes at the expense of the host fitness. And how do they do? Well, they may do this through two potential strategies, generating cravings for foods that they specialize on, or foods that suppress the competitors, their competitors. So in other words, when I feel, oh, tonight I want pizza, it's not the human part of me that say so. Are the microbes in my gut that want pizza for one of the two reasons? Maybe because pizza is good for them, 
or maybe because pizza is bad for their competitors. I don't know. And I go there and I, like a brainless individual, I eat pizza thinking that I like it actually is something that goes to increase the fitness of the microbes who tell me to eat pizza. But they can do something that is even more intriguing. They may induce dysphoria. Dysphoria means, oh, we are not happy until we eat foods that enhance their fitness. Again, I'm craving for something. I'm craving, I don't know for what. And again, I think that I, Marco, the human, I'm craving for this because I like that. I come from Mediterranean countries. That's why I like olive oil. No, it's not me. Are the microbes that they induce this feeling of not satisfaction until I eat food that enhance the microbial fitness. Now, uh, so let's say who manipulates whom. And they say, because microbiota are easily manipulatable by prebiotics, probiotics, antibiotics, fecal transplants, and dietary changes, altering our microbiota offers a tractable approach to otherwise intractable problems of obesity and unhealthy eating. Point again is uh, to see who is manipulating whom. And uh, so far, this question is unsolved. And of course, this leads to the question, what happened to the human free will? Now, whose will is the one that makes me crave for pizza or for meat or for fish or becoming vegan? Whose will? Is my human will or is the microbial will? Here in Tucson, Arizona, two hours south from here, and there is this great researcher, Professor Stuart Hameroff. He has been working also on his brain with ultrasounds. And he even uh, goes to quantum biology. And this is a very interesting reading, how quantum brain biology can rescue conscious free will. So you see, we are entering into some realm of knowledge and science that are truly complicated, quantum brain biology free will whose free will are we obeying to who knows but again let me show you this paper that is not so metaphysical but it's very interesting here what these researchers did in 2013 they took mice and then they fed mice with a regular diet or with a diet that was enriched in a particular probiotic that is called Mycobacterium vaccae, that is Mycobacterium of cows, something that you find commonly in farms because it is associated with cows. To make the story very short, they use uh, this maze test. In other words, when mice are put in a maze, they're not happy at all. They feel a sense of anxiety that can be measured. So the researchers found out that the level of anxiety and therefore the performance of the mice was absolutely dependent on the presence or the absence of this probiotic. In the absence of this probiotic, the mice were very shy, they were afraid, they were very anxious and could not exit the maze efficiently. But when the mice were fed this probiotic, the Mycobacterium vaccae, that is not good for humans, but for mice is good, then their behavior completely changed. They became courageous, they became arduous, they became brave, they felt no anxiety, and they were able to perform the task that was to exit from the maze in a very short period of time. Now, think simply about, let's say, a combat situation. So you have soldiers in an urban combat situation. What if they are afraid, they are anxious, they cannot aim at the enemy, and they are afraid and they're trembling in a corner? Well, they're very vulnerable. But just think that you feed them with some ad hoc formulated probiotic and they are not anxious anymore. They are brave, they are courageous, they can take decisions and they can exit from that uh, uh, dreadful situation winning. Well, it's a big difference. Big difference that has already been demonstrated in mice and we have some evidence that it works in humans as well. And uh, this paper also has a strange title, 
melancholic microbes, a link between gut microbiota and depression? Well, question mark now could be removed because now we know that there is a link. And uh, it, see, it says here that there is a growing awareness of the potential for microbiota to influence gut-brain communication in health and disease. A variety of strategies have been used to study the impact of the microbiota on brain function. And these include antibiotic use, probiotic treatments, fecal microbiota transplantation, and so on. In other words, again, you change the microbes in your gut, you change your behavior. You were shy, you were afraid, you become brave and courageous. You were unable to perform a task, now you're able to perform a task. So I think you all see the potential for this. Again, where is the free will? Where is the ability to decide whether to perform a task or not? Apparently, is not only residing inside our heads, apparently is associated with the non-human part of our brain, that is the third brain. Also, this paper is interesting. Voices from within, gut microbes and the central nervous system. Here it says, further understanding of the mechanisms underlying microbiome gut-brain communication will provide us with new insight into the symbiotic relationship between gut microbiota and their mammalian host and help us identify the potential for microbial-based therapeutic strategies to aid in the treatment of mood disorders. Now, I wish to focus here on the communication. The communication between the microbes, also called the cell brain, the gut, and the brain. Why I wanted to... Yes, yes, I understand what you're saying. You want me to mute my microphone. Hold on. Hold on. What about now? Can you hear me now? Good, thank you. All right, so let's talk about communication between our third non-human brain, our gut, the neurons in our gut, and the neurons inside our head. Because communication is always bidirectional. So there are no one-way streets in nature. We as humans, we can say this is a one-way street, but in reality, every street can be uh, used in both ways. Now, this is interesting. As I mentioned in one of the previous uh, lectures, I have been a contributor of this famous Encyclopedia of Cancer that presents contribution by international authorities and it is considered a landmark achievement in the domain of cancer research, the Bible of Cancer. And this paper that I contributed together with a colleague of mine, Dr. Stefano Atterini from Florence, Italy, is about the effects of electromagnetic fields in cancer. It's in a very interesting topic, and you can go and read the chapter, and you can go and find out whether your iPhones are good or not for your health. But this is not the point I wanted to cover at this moment. At this moment, I want to cover something that had gone uh, practically undetected for years. The point is that we have neurons in our gut, and these had been known for several decades. These neurons, they fire electrochemical signals, like all neurons. Electrochemical signals, albeit very, very weak, they generate electromagnetic fields. You know, they generate the electromagnetic fields that you can record with an electroencephalogram. Those in the gut are very weak, so you cannot record them. However, these electromagnetic fields that are continuously generated inside our gut by our second brain, they are strong enough to alter gene expression. So essentially, they induce the expression of some proteins that are called heat shock proteins. But interestingly, they also influence the viability and the function of the microbes inside our gut. So it is well true that the microbes inside, inside our gut, they influence our functions. But it's also true that the neurons in our gut influence the function of the microbes. <coughs> 
Therefore, in this paper, we hypothesize that alteration of the microbiome may be one of the mechanisms through which the electromagnetic fields, both endogenous or exogenous, like cell phones, exert their biological effects. And therefore, this opens a new perspective in assessing the risk for health and in preventing those risks. In other words, when we look at the research that has been performed now for decades on the use of cell phones and analog devices, all the research has been conducted to check whether these electromagnetic fields, they affect the human cells. Point is that these fields, they also affect the microbial cells. And since modification of the microbiome is not yet understood, we don't know in the end what is the impact of electromagnetic fields on the microbiome. We know that microbes and the microbiome may amplify or mitigate carcinogenesis, that is the onset and development of cancer, the responsiveness to cancer medicines and cancer-associated complications. Therefore, the electromagnetic fields that modify the microbiome may interfere all these cancer-related responses. But again, we are able to manipulate because we could develop functional foods containing probiotics that could prevent and treat cancer because their effect on the microbiome that is affected by the electromagnetic field. So this is another area of research that still awaits to be explored, that is the development of probiotics or probiotic approaches to prevent the damage inflicted to the microbiome by the electromagnetic fields that surround us. And now let's move from the third to the fourth brain. And it's not over as yet. Now, as you know, I've been working in the field of AIDS, being a very controversial author of AIDS, of AIDS papers together with the famous or infamous Professor Peter Duesberg from Berkeley. And this is the paper we published in 2011, describing the epidemic of HIV infection and AIDS in Africa and other parts of the world. And because of my interest in AIDS, I still read papers on AIDS. I'm not working on AIDS anymore, but I still read papers, papers on AIDS. And this paper was published by Canadian researchers in Alberta, Canada, in 2012. So what did these AIDS researchers uh, did, do? What they were looking for? For something that at first may appear rather trivial. Or they say, okay, AIDS, it's immune deficiency. So during immune deficiency, you have opportunistic infections, which means microbes that usually don't cause any disease become pathogenic when your immune system is not working. So let's look at the brain of individuals who have died of AIDS. And let's see if we find microbes that have caused brain disease because the host was immune depressed because of AIDS. So again, seems rather logical, rather linear. What happened, however, is that they had to run controls. So check the microbial status of the brain of people who have died of other diseases but were perfectly immune competent, which means their immune system was working perfectly well. What they found was rather astonishing, that in the brains of people who had the perfect immune system, there were many, many microbes. And so let's read what they write. In an organ, the brain inside our heads, widely assumed to be free of infectious agents in the absence of a specific disease process, like a meningitis, autopsied and surgically derived human brain specimens show the restricted but distinct bacterial population in the present studies, which was composed of bacterial classes chiefly recognized in the physical environment, soil and water. The source of these agents, so where these bacteria that are inside our brains come from, oral consumption, inhalation, 
with eventual transport to the brain as intracellular agents by activated leukocytes trafficking into the brain. In other words, we, of course, don't live in a sterile world, so we eat or breathe microbes from the environment. Those microbes don't arrive inside our heads directly. First, they are included into cells of the immune system, mainly lymphocytes and macrophages. Please remember macrophages. And are these cells of the immune system who carry them inside our brains. Now, the immune system is supposed to defend us. So if the cells carry the microbes inside the brain, they know what they're doing. And they're doing something good because we need the microbes inside our heads for our human neurons to work properly. And they go on and they write, since bacteria express multiple molecules, their capacity for influencing brain function is nothing but immense. So again, who is thinking what? Which cells are responsible for what I'm saying now? The human cells that make my Marcos body or the microbial cells, probably both. And as they write, studies focused on delineating the brain's microbiome at the species level. That is, we don't know essentially which bacteria are inside our brain. Together with their individual effects on host cell physiology, which means their effects on my cells, might lead to a greater understanding of human neurobiology, including cognitive, motor, sensory, and behavioral functions, which means absolutely everything. And now we may even wonder if uh, microbes are responsible for the evolution of the brain as we know it. These are neuronal cells in a petri dish in culture. These are experiments that I did before coming to the US. And this is interesting. These Canadian researchers, they uh, expanded the research and they went on looking whether other animals had bacteria in their brains. And they found out, quite surprisingly, that only humans and primates, like uh, the great apes, had microbes. Other animals, other vertebrates had not. So it appears that the presence of a brain microbiome is peculiar to the primates. And since we are primates and we think of ourselves as like the predominant species on, on this planet, uh, we may easily think that what makes us different from dogs and cats as far as our brain functions are concerned could be the presence of the microbes inside our brains. And remember, the microbes, they arrive to the brain carried by the macrophages. So these cells of the immune system, they play a vital role, not only in defending ourselves from viruses or cancer cells, but also in the function of our brains, plural. Now, this is a paper that we published in 2015, where we studied this gene called RANX2 that is important in the evolution of the human brain. So again, this gene is responsible for the cranial capacity, that is the volume of the brain from the primates to the man. Now, it is interesting and it is consistent with what we know until now that this gene, RANX2, is under the control of probiotics in this case of the lactobacillus rhamnosus. In other words, this gene can function properly and therefore can contribute to the development of our brain and also contributed to the evolution of our brain only in the presence of probiotics like the lactobacillus rhamnosus, that is the probiotic you find in yogurts or kefirs. Now you may say, Okay, but this paper was done on this uh, Daniel Rerio, that is the zebrafish. And uh, as I said some time ago, the zebrafish and the beautiful people in San Diego have little in common. The small fish and beautiful people, what do they have in common? Well, they have very much in common. In this paper that is uh, still submitted, has not been published, 
we study the genes that control speech and language in humans and we compared those genes that have these fancy names in a number of other species including the zebrafish and we ended up concluding because of the observation that the amino acid sequence in the zebrafish in the segment ranging from this position to this other position there is a large homology with a human sequence so this means that the probiotics most likely they played a fundamental role in the development of our brain and in the evolution of our brain. Let me show you some unpublished data that corroborate what I'm tell I've been telling you so far. So what did we do back in Europe in our lab? These are human neurons on a Petri dish. These are cells, you see they are elongated, Essentially, they do very little. These two, they try to establish a connection. It is called a synapsis. And these also try to establish a connection. But all in all, they sit there. They don't do very much. Then we did what uh, no cell biologist would do. We prepared a probiotic yogurt. As you know, together with my wife, we have developed a probiotic yogurt that appears to be very health beneficial. So we prepared our probiotic yogurt and then we filtered the yogurt and we kept the microbes. So essentially after having cultured the yogurt, we kept the microbes and then we did what no cell biologist would like to do. That is, we put the microbes in contact with the human neurons in a Petri dish. Usually, when you contaminate cell cultures with microbes, the cell die. Simply, they die because of the overgrowth of the microbes. But, apparently, when you take probiotics or microbes that apparently are part of our brains, the neurons, not only they don't die, they modify their behavior, and look what they do. They form circuits, they form connections. Now, you can see that this slide is very different from the other one. In the other one, the background was even, you see? And the enlargement is the same, the magnification is the same. Here, the background is not even because all these tiny, tiny dots are the microbes, microbes of the yogurt. They are here, and you see them everywhere. But the presence of these microbes that derive from this yogurt, they changed the behavior of the cells. And now the cells, not only they are more because they have duplicated, but they establish many, many circuits. So here you can see a big circuit, but you also see many short circuits between these cells, these cells. You see how many, which what a complex network of circuits among these neurons. And uh, all neuroscientists agree as of today that the formation of networks of signaling is at the basis of any type of intelligence, whether artificial or non-artificial. And this leads us uh, to the latter part of my talk to describe how all this may relate to neurological diseases and in particular to autism. This is a paper we published in December 2015 together with the late Dr. Jeff Brastreet and my wife Stefania Pacini and in this paper we put forward an hypothesis explaining how infection or inflammation of the lymph nodes that are inside our necks and are called deep cervical nodes may impair the circulation of lymph inside the brain and this disrupts the recirculation of the cells of the immune system, in particular the macrophages. And this leads to a disruption of the brain microbiome. Because we have learned, and there is a published evidence, that microbes reach the brain using the cells of the immune system that are the macrophages, that carry them and they travel to the lymphatic vessels that were discovered only one year ago. And now that we have all the information, we have all the elements to reconstitute the brain microbiome or fourth brain if you prefer, or 
to preserve the brain microbiome. So here we have two options. Uh, let's say that we are very healthy with no neurological issue, so we may want to preserve this uh, healthy status of our brain. And in order to preserve this healthy status of our brain, just like we want to have a good gut microbiome, and that's why there are so many probiotics and prebiotics on the market, because everybody wants a good gut microbiome. But I think that from today, everybody also wants to have a good brain microbiome. And we also may need to restore the brain microbiome if for any reason there has been a disruption of its integrity. And together with the brain microbiome, of course, we reconstitute the immune system of the brain. So essentially, we need the two elements. On one side, we need the elements first identified by Dr. Eli Mechnikov, the probiotics, the friendly bacteria. We need the friendly bacteria because uh, they have to be there. Otherwise, uh, there is no brain microbiome. And since the influence of the microbes on the brain function is immense, we want to have a good influence. But we also need the cells that carry the good bacteria. And these cells are mainly the macrophages, cells that I've been studying since the 90s when I was at the NCI, at the NIH, and I published this paper on this protein that is called the macrophage stimulating factor CSF1. In this case, it was studied in the context of a human cancer. So we need both things. And as you know, we now have them because we have some excellent probiotic and we have some excellent stimulant of macrophages, some excellent macrophage stimulating factor. And we need both of them if we want to maintain the health of our brain microbiome or fourth brain if we want to restore the brain microbiome should a damage have occurred. But, and this watch tells me that we are very close to the end, not all pre or probiotics are equal. And uh, the topic is immense, so maybe one day we can have a, a lecture dedicated only to the topic of prebiotics or probiotics. Let me just anticipate. Some prebiotics have been demonstrated to be harmful for health because, for example, they decrease the defense against the pathogenic microbes. In other words, they help the microbes that cause disease. They do not favor the integrity of the permeability of the gut barrier, it's called leaky gut. So uh, when we say prebiotics, uh, they are not all equal. Some of them may be beneficial, some of them may be very detrimental. And the same applies for probiotics, they are not all equal. But since uh, I may have a conflict of interest because I have invented a probiotic that I think it's uh, maybe the best in the world, let's not listen to my words and let's see what these, uh, again, Canadian researchers did with some probiotic yogurt that has nothing to do with the product that myself and my wife have invented. Now, a short story, give me five more minutes. Who are these uh, people? Uh, the lead researchers is uh, Professor Gregor Ray. Uh, they come from Canada and they are considered the top microbiologists in the world. So we're talking about the highest level of science. <clears throat> they published in the Journal of Gastroenterology in 2010, this article whose title is clearly understandable. Probiotic yogurt consumption is associated with an increase of CD4. CD4 are the cells of the immune system that are typically low in HIV AIDS patients. So an increase is a good thing among people living with HIV AIDS. So let's read simply the conclusions. Oh, by the way, uh, to give some honor also to my former countrymen, uh, they not only come from the Canadian Research and Development Center for Probiotics in London, Canada, but also from the University of Brescia, Northern Italy. So, conclusions. The introduction of probiotic yogurt Again, a probiotic yogurt, a real yogurt, something that you drink or you 
put in your mouth with a spoon, made by local women in a low-income community in Tanzania, was significantly associated with an increase in CD4 count among consumers living with HIV. So what did they do? From Brescia and from London, Canada, they brought the ferments to Tanzania. They taught the local women of these impoverished communities how to make the yogurt. The women made the yogurt, the women gave the yogurt to people with HIV and AIDS. Uh, they even make a, a little money, which uh, was good because it stimulated a microeconomy over there, which was a very good thing. And the people with HIV and AIDS who consumed the yogurt, they reported significant benefits, improvement in their weight gain, uh, less diarrhea, less uh, GI tract issues, and most important, a stimulation of the immune system measured by CD4 cell counts, which obviously is the main thing in an AIDS patient. So very good results, excellent results, and the discussion. The study site, Tanzania, is typical of many low-income communities in the developing world in which access to daily nutrition and medical care is limited and HIV infection is highly prevalent. The introduction of a locally produced highly nutrition food, yogurt, supplemented with a probiotic strain, not only provides an economic stimulus for farmers and those producing the yogurt, but may also improve the immune function among those living with HIV and their ability to work. And to their knowledge, this study is the first to report the long-term effects of probiotic yogurt on CD4 count among people living with HIV AIDS. Now here the key word is not probiotic, the key word is yogurt. Why? Because these uh, researchers, they thought they had found more or less the cure for AIDS in Africa, which is not a little thing. But they immediately began to receive criticism. Why? Because everybody say, okay, good, we don't discuss your results, we believe your results. Point is that a yogurt needs to be refrigerated. Only few people, only those who live around these uh, women who produce the yogurt can benefit. But how can you deliver a yogurt in the remote regions of Africa without refrigeration? And you cannot ship refrigerator. So all in all, they say the you have done very little, you have helped very few people. So this project is unfeasible, is not practicable on a large scale. So don't be overexcited. You have not defeated AIDS in Africa. You have achieved some results. But since you cannot distribute a yogurt all over a continent, but not even in Europe or in America, it could be difficult. So you have not achieved very much. Okay, no problem. We are the best microbiologists in the world. We perfectly know which microbial strains or which probiotics we have placed in this yogurt. It's our yogurt. We developed this yogurt. We know exactly which strains we have put in this yogurt. So why don't we simply take those strains, forget about the yogurt, it's too complicated to be produced. Like my product, you have to make it once a week, you have to boil the milk, and the same problems apply in Africa, maybe much, much worse. So forget about the yogurt. Let's take the bacteria, the probiotics. Let's put them in a capsule. So no need for refrigeration, no need for lengthy preparation, and simply give the capsules with the probiotics to people with HIV or AIDS. And let's see what happens. So follow my reasoning. The probiotic yogurt had proven effective in stimulating the immune system and improving general health in immune depressed subjects in Africa. So the worst possible scenario. And it had proven successful. So they say, let's take the same identical strains put them in a capsule, so this is an encapsulated probiotic, like those that you find in all grocery stores or specialty stores, encapsulated probiotics. Let's give to those people and, and, 
and the result is around zero. Nothing, nada. No efficacy. And they have to conclude that the inefficacy of the probiotic strains in preserving the immune function may be the result of using encapsulated probiotics versus the use of probiotic yogurt with the same probiotic strains in previous studies that is in the study published in 2010. So what does this mean? As I said, not all probiotics are equal. Encapsulated probiotics have been demonstrated to be completely ineffective. And again, it is not me who is saying this. These are the most respected microbiologists in the world. In this case, also from Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and of course in Tanzania. In other words, there is uh, the risk that when you go and buy an encapsulated probiotic, essentially you're wasting your money. At least uh, this is what can be deducted from these uh, two papers published uh, one year apart from the same identical group, and I would say completely against their own interest. And why is this? That's very simple. In a fermented product like a yogurt or a kefir, the microbes are together with their own environment that they have contributed in modifying. But if you take the microbes alone by themselves, they are completely useless as long as uh, these papers have clearly demonstrated. Why? Take, for example, this paper that was published uh, just a few weeks ago in 2015. These researchers from Germany and Turkey, well, you know that Turkey is where kefirs or yogurts were born, so they have a millennia long tradition, published a paper in the Journal of Proteomics where they describe all the peptides and proteins that are formed during the process of fermentation. In other words, all these molecules are inside a yogurt or a kefir in this case. Of course, they're not in an encapsulated probiotics. And just take a quick look at the health benefits of these molecules. They normalize blood pressure because they inhibit the angiotensin converting enzyme. They prevent a thrombosis. They favor the binding of minerals. They work on pain, in controlling pain. They modulate the immune system. They are antimicrobial, which means they kill the bad bugs and they're beneficial for the good bugs. And they are anti-aging because they're antioxidant. All this does not exist in an encapsulated probiotic. So essentially, uh, this is what those papers tell us. And now we are at the conclusions. We have at least four brains that are closely integrated. Two of these brains that comprise the majority of cells are non-human, are microbial. And their influence on the human counterpart, as they say, is immense. Most likely the microbes were instrumental in the evolution of our first brain, and they are essential for the development and function of our brains. The mi microbes, here we become philosophical, manipulate our will for their purposes, but maybe we can manipulate our microbial composition. So we can manipulate those who manipulate us. And the immune system, thanks to the macrophages, appears to be the connection between the four brains. And this was my last, last slide, and I thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'm open for question and answers. I guess there will be many, but as you may realize, uh, tonight I've given you a deal, a great deal of revolutionary and novel information. And let me just stress that all my st statements, bar none, 
They are all backed by peer-reviewed scientific publications that you can retrieve in PubMed. Thank you so much. Wow. That was incredible. Um, I don't know if anyone else was madly trying to write and keep up, but it changes everything. And, um, and so what I'd like to do right now is, first of all, say a massive, massive, massive thank you, uh, Dr. Ger, for sharing this. Definitely, yes, we are going to take you up on the offer to um, get more into prebiotics and probiotics because I think that's a very relevant conversation for everyone. And uh, at this point, what I'd love to do is um, if you have a question, everybody is going to stay muted. So you will manually unmute yourself and just say your name and where you're from uh, and ask your question at this point. Okay, please. Hi, Dr. Marco and Laurie and everybody. It's Robin calling from Australia. Um, I've been following your lectures, Dr. Marco, and I just think you're the most amazing person ever. And I think that I'm just so pleased that Laurie and, and, uh, and others have managed to color you and that you speak so wonderfully and so clearly and make an otherwise complicated topic um, so clear. I have a background in micro microbiology and health sciences, so I, I'm following it fine, but I can imagine that some people would be sitting there looking at those names and numbers and just going, ah. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time because I'm sure others have questions. I have a, just a couple. First of all, um, you talk about the, the microbes in the gut and the microbes in the brain. Are they the same microbes? So when we're taking in the yogurt microbes, um, are these the microbes that are being transported to the brain? Because at one point you mentioned that the brain microbes are also those found in soil and water. Uh, well, uh, only part. In other words, the ma brain microbiome, uh, we're just beginning to study it, so we know very little. And we know that uh, uh, the, it shares uh, some species with the gut microbiome but many less. In other words, uh, only few species, uh, they reside in our brains. They're the same species that you find in soil and water and therefore in the gut, but the gut has a much larger biodiversity. Apparently, during the co-evolution, a few strains of microbes have evolved to be together with our neurons. So it's not that the brain microbiome is a super impossible to the gut microbiome. They are different. They share some strains. But again, we know little about the gut microbiome and much less about the brain microbiome. What we know is that in order for the two microbiomes to be in balance, we need two things. We need the lymphatic meningeal vessels that are lymphatic vessels that had been discovered only one year ago, I would say less than one year ago. So this a physical anatomical connection between the brain and the general immune system was not known until one year ago. So one year ago it was discovered that there are lymphatic vessels in the meninges and in the brain that are directly connected with the lymphatic system in our neck and from the neck everywhere else. So we need that those vessels are open. And every time we have a sore throat, every time we have an, a cold or things like that, an infection or inflammation inside these nodes, those uh, lymphatic vessels may become clogged. So first thing we need, otherwise there is no communication between the microbiome inside the brain and the microbiome inside the gut. Second thing that we need are macrophages and also T lymphocytes in good health. If we don't have enough macrophages or if those macrophages are poorly activated because we miss the factors that activate them, we don't have enough cells or not so functional cells to carry the microbes from the other parts of the body to the brain and vice versa. So essentially it's a dual mechanism. That's why in the past, very good results had been seen in a number of neurological and neurodevelopmental conditions using, for example, anti-inflammatory drugs or drugs that stimulated the immune system. But the two things had never been put together until this publication of ours at this, in December 2015. So this is what we know now, but uh, to be honest, we are just at the beginning of this uh, uh, 
area of research or this field of research. We, we know that we know very little, but we are beginning to see how the two microbiomes uh, can be in balance. Very, very, very exciting research, and I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled, and I look forward to following it. Can I just ask one more quick question? You, when you showed the, the, um, the CAT scans or MRIs of the brains um, that had hydrocephaly and that had so much fluid and there was very little brain, and you said, yet yeah, these people function normally, um, you're talking about the Broadman areas, and I'm just wondering, because I don't know that much about brain anatomy uh, versus function, is it possible that the Broadman areas are superficial? I mean, how deep do they actually go? So that as long as you've got that superficial brain area... Um, I, I'll possible. show you. Sorry to disappoint you, but this was one of the first things that uh, came in mind. Uh, just to give you an idea, a little bit of neuroanatomy. Uh, let's take the area number nine, the one that mm -hmm. controls all these things, verbal fluency, which uh, is what I'm lacking in English included. Now, <laughs> not at all. This is, this is a lateral view, oh, okay? okay? And this is a medial view. Right. And uh, all these, uh, it means that it goes uh, from the lateral down to the medial, so the entire thickness of the hemisphere. And uh, if you look uh, at this other area, the area number 40, 46, uh, it is embedded in the depth of okay. the frontal lobe. So mm -hmm. when then you have uh, this picture, everything is gone here. Mm. Where is it? Mm. Now, something that people say, but uh, I prevent uh, a manifestation of ignorance, is, oh, well, they are compressed, they are smaller. I'm sorry, <laughs> it doesn't work like this. Neurons, they have a fixed size. Here, you simply have many less neurons, not that they are smaller. You have many, many less neurons, simply because uh, during uh, his early ages, uh, this uh, guy had this compression. So they uh, underwent apoptosis, uh, and they did not develop normally. Nevertheless, even though the number of neurons you have is only about 5% of the neurons you should have, nevertheless, this guy was able to function perfectly normally. So there is no other organ in the body where you can remove 95% of its tissue and still be alive. You cannot remove 95% of your lungs, of your heart, of your kidneys and still be alive. And not to mention be alive and well, because this guy was alive and well. He simply had a mild uh, leg weakness that most likely was not even related to this situation. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed that and I look forward to your future lectures. Thank you. Is there anyone else with a question or comment or some feedback? Again, please unmute yourself manually, bottom left of your screen. Yeah, hi, this is Anke. I'm just blown away, Dr. Marco. You are just <laughs> such an amazing, like, I, I don't know. I, it's just unbelievable. Um, and I'm very ignorant because I'm not a medical doctor. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm just looking at this last slide that you have up here, where there's basically not much brain matter left. Um, and my question is, are you suggesting that the capacity to function well was just picked up by one of the other four brains to compensate or maybe combination of, of, of the other three or, or two of them? Honestly, I don't know. Nobody knows. And the majority of the medical scientific community chose the easy path. Simply ignore these findings. Because if you ignore the fi these findings, uh, you continue to live happy. If you are a teacher of neuroanatomy, you keep on teaching neuroanatomy. If you are a neurologist, you keep on teaching neurology and you don't have to reconsider everything. I don't know. Explanations could be very many. Uh, like the boxer that uh, we have observed, because one explanation for this guy could be that these hydrocephalus occurred early in his life, so he had the time to adapt. But in other cases, it may occur late in life, and still people adapt very well. Again, uh, think uh, that we are aliens, and we come to this earth, and we see automobiles running on the highway. 
and we wonder, oh, what makes the automobiles run? And since we are aliens and uh, we don't know, we think, oh, oh, maybe are those things that they call a seats. And then they remove the seats and the automobile, they keep on running. So I say, okay, no, it's not the seats. Maybe the, the seats, of course, they're useful because if you don't sit, it becomes uncomfortable. When they remove the engine, the uh, car doesn't run any lo longer. Here we know that we can remove the brain inside our heads and still we run and we uh, work as a civil servants. We marry, we have children and we drive our cars. So evidently, is not so indispensable. Wow. Period. I, I have no other explanation. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the next uh, lecture. You Thank you. Me. Thank you. I, I wish to have some comments uh, by Mr. Greenlaw if he's uh, still uh, awake. Who knows? Maybe his brain has gone completely. Peter, are you there? Yeah, I just had to, I had to unmute myself. Um, I'm sitting <laughs> in, in just uh, utter shock because again, <laughs> uh, you did spring the fourth brain on me. I mean, now we got to write another book called Your Fourth Brain. I mean, we got to, we have to edit your third brain first and now we got to do the fourth brain. But uh, no, the, the, for the, you know, and I, I've told you this before. And for me, because I'm such a student, the thing that I now understand is that the, Third brain microbes are being transported into the brain on the back of macrophages, which is something that no one knew. And that certainly may be one of the contributing factors to why the, the, the photographs here with, the, with the, the twins and or, you know, our, our, your famous, the boxer and or the guy in Marseille, why they're able to function. At least that's how I understand it. It's, because there's no other logical explanation. I mean, you look at these slides, I mean, there's basically no brain there. How did, I mean, it's, I've, I've stopped saying how does it happen because it is happening. But I think more importantly, I think that, you know, our initial start of your third brain, we started in 2015, when I have spent a lot of time saying, you know, we really need to do a major, major rewrite because what we started out with is literally like a first grade book compared to what you've now discovered literally in the last little more than you know a year and a few months i mean it's just it's just crazy to think that we've come so far so fast and i guess like i said before i don't think i overstated it this may be one of the greatest discoveries in the history of mankind the microbiome is actually a brain that, that these microbes are a heck of a lot more than just sort of floating around inside of us they really are they have neurons and they're creating this function, which has now been demonstrated scientifically in your lecture tonight, which I, I think was your best one, by the way. I'm prejudiced, but I would tell you if I didn't think that. So you don't have to call me after the call now. I'm giving you my, my take. Because <laughs> <laughs> normally he calls me after these, well, how did you like it? I'm going, oh my gosh, I have a, I have a brain hernia. But uh, honestly, this, this is so profound. And also for the first time, I really got the connection between the encapsulated or the capsule probiotic not working on the HIV patients where the interaction of the yogurt and the probiotic created these new, which you've taught me, these new peptides and maybe three or 400 what you call neuroprotective molecules that obviously have a dramatic impact. So it's not enough just to have a probiotic. It's that the probiotic contained in, let's say, a yogurt is, is – thousands of times more effective than anything we ever maybe thought before. And again, this was not your research. This was these other scientific guys that said, holy smokes, let alone, and they weren't even feeding them your yogurt, your invention. So who knows what would happen if they did that? So I'm, I'm well, uh, thrilled. I'm thrilled. We, we, we know what happens because uh, as I uh, presented uh, in um, another lecture in January, when we fed our own product, uh, we saw a dramatic increase in CD4 and natural killer cells, and we presented those results exactly one year after those Canadian researchers at the sixth AIDS Congress that was held in 2011 in Rome. So essentially, uh, there is general consensus that uh, fermented products like yogurts and kefirs, uh, then we can discuss whether our is better than theirs, but in any case, 
fermented products, uh, they do reconstitute uh, the immune system. Uh, in those days, we only spoke about the immune system. Now we know that they do reconstitute not only the gut microbiome, and this is rather obvious, but they also reconstitute uh, the brain microbiome. And now we can explain why we see wonderful results uh, in people with neurological disabilities, uh, or with like, all autism. So. like autism, which I'm sure you're going to present this in May at the autism conference. I'm sure you're going to present this stuff because this evidence and those slides showing the neurons and the glial cells and those reconnections, I mean, just it totally explains your findings that you published with Dr. Bradstreet where you saw those black holes in the brain. Now it's really making sense that you observed what was happening, but maybe for the first time now with this other research, it becomes clear that, oh yeah, this is really what's going on because the microbes were transplanted in the brain and really were reconstituting neurons and, and, and the neurological connections. Am I, am I correct in that assumption? You are absolutely correct. And this also explains why by stimulating the macrophages, uh, uh, so many good effects are observed, not because the macrophages uh, exert any defense. No, it makes sense. If you stimulate the macrophages and you see a decrease of a viral infection, this is rather logical. Macrophages are cells of the immune system. They go and fight the virus. If you stimulate the macrophages and they go and kill the cancer cells, also this is rather logical. What was missing is why, if we stimulate the macrophages, then the symptoms of Alzheimer or Parkinson or autism, they improve. What have the macrophages to do? And now we know the macrophages, they carry the good microbes to the brains where the microbiome has been disrupted. So now we understand something that has, had already been observed but had no explanation. So this is very exciting. And I thank Lori and I thank all the team or teams, plural, that gave me the opportunity to share this uh, exciting information with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And something that's coming up, I just wanted to ask this question for you, um, Dr. Joe. The beyond exciting in terms of like totally surprising me as well with the fourth brain, what is coming to my mind again more and more is that um, the concept that the miracle of the human body, the more we understand, the more we realize that we actually can heal itself and the nutrition and the nourishment that we actually choose to put in our bodies is going to have a direct impact on that microbiome. And is that something that is just not obvious to me that, um, as you said, like not only is it, uh, it does matter that the encapsulated probiotic, which is a kind that I've been having, so uh, clearly knowing that it's not going to have as an effective um, result as uh, a fermented one is, is huge, but also looking at our food supply, looking at um, autoimmune, looking at learning disabled spectrum, autism spectrum, all of those things, you know, what came up was what's the nutrition like and the impact it's having or lack of and the drainage factor. Because I know just as a teacher, so many kids who are diagnosed with learning disabilities have had multiple, multiple infections, usually ear infections where the drainage is blocked. And I just wondered um, where we go from here with that. Well, uh, we have to entirely revise our concept of nutrition. And again, this may become a little bit too philosophical too, or too metaphysical, but it's rather physiological. Until now, we think of nutrition in terms of calories or at best in terms of proteins, fats and sugars which of course it is right, but most likely is very limited. Now that we know that 99% or maybe more of the genetic information that controls and directs our body and our functions, including those of the brain, are coming from microbes. And the microbes are coming from the environment, which means from what we eat, what we drink, what we breathe. Now, nutrition is not anymore a question of calories or proteins. Nutrition is a question of genetic information. 
The disnutrition is not like when I put gasoline in the tank of my car, that it is burned, so it produces calories that move my car. Until now, we have thought about nutrition exactly as if it were a fuel for the consumption, energy consumption of our cells. It is not. It is much more than that. It is also that, but much more. Because when you eat uh, an apple, you are not only eating the fruit or the uh, fructose in the apple. You are eating all the microbes that are in that apple. Those microbes, they carry genetic information that contributes to the 99% of the genetic information in your body. And so where that apple has been grown makes a big difference. If pesticides were used, or even the hands of the person who has picked that apple make a difference. So as uh, the more we study, the more we see the complexity of nutrition. Nutrition is nothing but an exchange of information. So nutrition, again, is not like putting gas in the tank. Nutrition is like a continuous exchange of information between the environment and ourselves. And when we say ourselves, we mean our human self and our microbial self. And now that I'm talking, I am breathing, and I'm breathing air. And the air in Arizona, of course, is different than the air in Florence, Italy. I'm breathing different microbes, and what I will be eating tonight will contain a different information. And so my entire body, which is composed by 99% of microbial information, is different. I think I am the same person. In my ID, my name remains the same. In my passport, my identity remains the same. But actually, by moving from Europe to Arizona, I am a completely different being, living being. Why? Not because I speak a different language, but because my microbial composition right now is very different than my microbial composition when I was back in Europe. And this makes sense. So on my documents, I may have the same name, but all the genetic information is different. So as you can see here, we are change, completely changing our perspective and the ramifications are almost endless. So we may keep on talking for hours and hours, but the ramifications are absolutely endless. Or even if you think about the concept of free will, where has the free will gone? Who is deciding whether I will like my dinner tonight or not? Is my human part, my microbial part, or maybe the microbial part that my human part has decided to put in my gut with my yogurt this morning, who knows, it becomes extremely complicated and equally fascinating. I'm very excited to hear more. Thank you. And as you say, we could go on and on. And I think this definitely begs for um, yet another visit from you to, uh, to share more of this really groundbreaking and, and life-altering um, knowledge and you know this the cliche of we we really only use 10 percent of our our brain capacity uh which is so true on so many levels now takes it to the next level that we really are only 10 percent to start with so there's a vast window of opportunity here which i'm excited to hear more of so uh with that thank you again so 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 much for this absolutely outstanding incredible evening of knowledge and uh, we will get this posted up as soon as possible okay thank you so much lori and i wish you a very happy evening to all of you and uh, dinner is ready and uh, who knows whether my microbes will like the dinner that my mother-in-law has prepared for me thank you so much and bye-bye good night everybody bye <laughs>